All right, so I had given, this is what I found in terms of looking at potential for, for future productivity. And then we start into the oil uh, issue. And of course, we recognize we've been using more oil than we've been finding for 20 years now. And so uh, a lot of discussion of biofuel and bioenergy. And so I, I couldn't help but uh, take a look down that road and I'd go to paper after paper that would show these huge big accelerations of biofuel uh, production and biomass production. And I thought, well, where is this going to all come from? When I just had pretty well convinced myself we don't have a big future in enhancing agricultural productivity, and now all of a sudden we have a new demand source. And uh, this is the one pay, uh, slide from my own lab. The rest of this is everybody else's work. But what we do is map biospheric productivity every year by satellite. And yet uh, what I find in those energy and economic projections of biofuels is they don't seem to attach their projections to actual biospheric capacity at all by our standards as as scientists, it's, it's demand-based. Society's going to need all this energy, and so we're going to go get it from biomass. And you go, hmm, this is going to get interesting. And um, Chris Field had a paper just a year ago where they looked at, well, maybe there's abandoned area, and we could look at the NPP from this abandoned area, and we could turn all that into bioenergy. Well, and they came to the conclusion that that might make for about 5% of the energy generated, uh, used in 2006. So a little bit of help, but certainly we're not going to solve the whole uh, problem from that direction. Now, starting from Peter Vituzic's uh, uh, seminal papers in the 80, late 80s and 90s of talking about the very idea of what fraction of, of a biospheric production humans are appropriating. Back in his first paper, the number was about 15%. Uh, the latest paper of Mark Inhofs brings that up to about 40%, and you see large areas of the world that we think it's closer to almost 100% of current biospheric production is already appropriated by humanity. And you start imagining, well, where's this extra 40% going to come from that we're going to need in the next 40 years. Now, it's interesting that Johan had this same book cover up. Uh, Jared Diamond actually has a summer place in Montana. You read this book, the first 50 pages of it are about Montana, where I live, which is supposedly the last best place that's still in good shape on the planet. And yet he takes you through the sorry state of affairs of Montana and it really makes the argument that uh, if humans are smug enough to think that we can just kind of muddle our way out of this, uh, uh, we've tried that before in multiple civilizations and failed. And now we're playing for all the marbles and in a, in a very real, in a very real way, um, I think we need the public to think about this at a more, shall we even say, emotional or even religious level. This is the most remote picture of Earth ever taken. Earth from a billion kilometers away. And uh, the first time I saw it, I, I guess it hit me beyond just the academic level. of We don't have any other options if we screw up this one. And within a billion kilometer radius, we haven't found anywhere to go. And uh, I really, the idea of us starting to define and, and really push to the politicians these ideas of fundamental boundaries for uh, global habitability is a term we used decades ago and out of fashion. Uh, planetary boundaries, I think, is an ex excellent label because we really got to do better at translating to the public and the policy makers that when we reach these limits, there's, there's no more bargaining room. We can't call up God and say, you know, we're sorry, we'll try to do a better job if you just give us another 100 years. And I, I think that's the level 
that uh, most of us scientists don't particularly like to interact at that level, but I'm afraid that's what the public reacts to best. Thank you.